the biggest trawler in the Scottish fishing fleet arrives fresh from the shipyard. But the Chrysandra's maiden voyage is far from plain sailing. The Renown is a third of the size and 20 years old. Her skipper, James Buchan, hopes that old-fashioned skill can make up for that. While on the Amity, sleepless nights add to the danger for skipper Jimmy Buchan and his crew. There aren't many skippers left like James Buchan. He uses a fishing technique that survived since the days of sailing ships. Handed down through generations, it's a skill that few fishermen still have. It's called seine net fishing. Seine net fishing is very labor intensive. It's very old fashioned way of fishing. It's something that my father taught me. He did it all his life, but there's very few of us left. Fishing with the same net is a very precise art. It uses two mile long ropes with a small net between them. The ropes are cast in a big circle. As they drag along the seabed, they scare the fish into the net behind them. Unlike the bigger nets of the trawlers, the same net has to be cast in exactly the right place to catch any fish. It's this challenge that appeals to James. There is like a bit of sport to the same net fishing. You can't literally keep shooting and hauling, hoping you catch some fish at this job. You really have to find them first and catch them. As he sets off in search of Haddock, James has only his hunter's instincts to guide him. Also setting sail is the Chris Andra. At over 70 meters, she's the biggest boat in the Scottish fleet. Her maiden voyage is a big moment for skipper Willie Tate. Oh, it's nice to get a new ship and uh, get it all tried out and get it working properly. Checking the, uh, the engines and uh, the fuel and everything is running the way it should be. For Chris Andra's first trip, Willie's joined by his cousin and joint skipper, Peter Tate. It is great getting a, a new boat. I mean, we've not fished yet, but we've had a few trials, and she's going to perform well, I think. The Chris Andra costs 12 million pounds to build. She has an 8,000 horsepower engine. On the bridge, there's over half a million pounds worth of navigation and sonar equipment. The Chris Andrews designed to catch fish like mackerel that swim in shoals up to a mile long, far bigger than the shoals of whitefish or prawns. This is fishing on a massive scale. But the men who do it are driven by the same desire. It's the same whitefish, prawn fishermen or pelagic fishermen. That it's, it's in your blood that, that you want to go out there and find your fish. Every year, the mackerel they're hunting migrate a thousand miles south from feeding grounds near Norway to deep water west of Ireland. By now, the mackerel should be somewhere off the coast of Shetland, where Chris Andrews' skippers hope to intercept them. The plan is to go away to the west of Shetland, search there, and hopefully, if we get 400 tons plus, then and we'll be happy with that. Everybody always likes to get it, uh, the job done as quickly as possible, but uh, sometimes it can't be done quickly. Uh, well, we will find them. We will find them. It will take the Chris Andra 36 hours to hunt down her quarry. Back in Peterhead, skipper Jimmy Buchan is getting his prawn trawler, Amity, ready for her next trip. Okay. She's been laid up for a month. Jimmy's first mate, Kevin, is impatient to get back to sea. It's been a while since we've been out. It must be a month since we've been fishing. 
tied up for oil jobs and paint and so we won't know what a prawn looks like when we catch it now. This is just like sewing. That's meant in the gear. My mother used to sew me trousers from. Now I can sew hers. Jimmy's search for prawns could take him almost anywhere in the North Sea. We've left here and we're going to be going 70 miles out into the North Sea, which is it's not quite in the middle, but I mean, you can see you have the Orkney and the Shetlands up here. You've got Norway here and you've got Denmark here, so who knows where we'll be finishing the trip. On the renown, James has come to a patch of the North Sea where he knows from experience that the sea bottom is hard and rocky. It's the kind of area Haddock like to feed in at this time of year. It's a wee place where the fish come to the spawn to lay their eggs. It's very hard bottom. If we get the net to come home, we've always got to go to home. It's the area. Same net fishing can be very strenuous for the crew, but deckhand James Mackay enjoys the atmosphere on board the Renown. The atmosphere aboard the boat is really good. Like, everyone gets on each other. There's very little, there's, there's very few arguments. I've never really, and I, I don't think I've ever seen one aboard here. Everyone gets on, it's a good atmosphere. It makes the job a lot easier. The way James runs his boat is based on his Christian faith. Religion, I think, still plays a big part in what the fishermen's makeup. There's no one aboard here that's more important than anyone else. Everyone knows their job, there's no swearing, there's no shouting. And it leads for a very happy working relationship with the whole world of us. The last thing you want is a crew shouting and swearing at one another. Despite their best efforts, James's haul is disappointing. There's not enough fish here. The fish are too small as well. It's We'll have to clear out. We'll, it maybe means 80, 90 miles steam further north, but we'll, we'll have to go north into deeper water. James has a trick up his sleeve. He knows another patch of rocky seabed that he's been keeping to himself for years. On the Amity, Jimmy's arrived at his first destination and he's cast his two nets to test it out. They've been towing for 15 miles hoping there are prawns somewhere on the seabed. Holy mother of Moses! We'll be seeing prawns in our sleep tonight, lads! <laughs> Jimmy's hit the jackpot first time. Their first haul yields as many prawns as they sometimes catch in a whole week. Very good haul for the first one. We keep getting this all trip. Thumbs up. The big haul of prawns means long hours of work for the crew to sort and pack them. It took us six hours to do that, because the prawns are awful small. If they were bigger, we'd have been quicker, but they're small prawns. If we keep getting this fishing for another three or four days, we're not going to have much sleep, God. That's when fatigue comes into things, and that's when accidents happen aboard boats. So you have to be very careful. After seven hours' work, there's no time for a meal for the exhausted crew. Just tea and a sandwich before the next haul. It's no fear Massive haul last day. Massive. Big, big haul this day. <laughs> We're falling asleep on our feet tonight. And we go for another seven hours. We're 
not complaining yet, but uh, two or three days into the trip, you might hear an odd moan here and there because we'll be getting tired. On the Renown, James has spent the day steaming north to hunt for Haddock at his secret fishing ground. This place has always been lucky for him, but there's bad news on the horizon. Someone else has got there first, and it's not just one boat, it's a pair. Towing a net half a mile long between them, these pair trawlers will have caught every mature fish in almost 10 square miles. There'll be nothing left for James's small seine net to catch. He tells the crew to stow the nets. His secret place has been found. Now the trawlers have disturbed the fish, it could be days before any come back. We'll leave that for seven, eight days, give it a rest. Hopefully they'll gather again to spawn. As long as there's uh, no one else fishes at them. Undaunted, James sets off again to seek out new fishing grounds. After a day at sea, the Chrysandra's only halfway to the area where they hope to intercept a shoal of mackerel. It'll be at least another 18 hours before they even shoot their net. Plenty of time for Peter to get nervous about how the ship will perform on her first ever haul. I mean, normally, normally our first haul, there, was, there will always be something going, going wrong because it's a, it's a new boat, the crew are all well, well trained, but they've never really shot the net here for real. So it, there will most, not definitely, but I would think there will be something going wrong. The long journey has its compensations for Bruce Bucken, the ship's engineer. Plenty of time to sleep in it, and obviously sit in my cabin and watch my TV, listen to music, and entertain myself somewhere or other. I've got my own cabin here, with my own uh, shower and toilet, and uh, I think run about me, my own fridge, stereo, satellite TV in here. On the Renown, James is still looking for an area to fish. His first mate, Bill Stevens, cheers up the crew with his soup of the day. Right, they ask for this every week. When are you going to make the fish soup? In one boat a long time ago when I was a young boy, I was just told you have to cook. Nobody else would do it and I was just told I had to do it, so I had to learn quick. Just give it a little steer, cook this for about 10, 15 minutes, and then add a sub cream before we put it on the table. And then the boys will be happy. On the Chris Andra, dinner's another matter altogether. Lewis Duthie was trained in one of Scotland's top hotels. It's a good boat to cook in, really. It's, you've got everything you want. You've got a frying pan and a, and a gimbal. Here, I got a griddle, big cooker, two walk-in, a walk-in fridge, a walk-in deep freeze, small fridge here. It's, it's very good to cook in one of these boats. But you can't please everyone because there's 11 of a crew and there's always one that doesn't like it. <laughs> Some of them. A dinner. What do you mean? Like girls in your boat. I thought they'll think I'd just sit here. Hey, Chris, is your favourite? <laughs> Set fun though. In the wheelhouse, James has decided on his next move. The crew will have to be up before dawn. After two days at sea, the Chris Andra is about to be put to the test for the first time. 
the founders the picture on the sonar is promising it looks quite a good show but this moment Tech fishing gear is second to none. The net itself is half a mile long. It's so big, if all goes well, they hope to bag at least 400 tons of fish. On such a large vessel, coordination is crucial. All right, you put the bag away, George, whenever you're ready. They have me. Do you hear me? Hello? Maybe you're looking at me. Why isn't he looking at me? The state of the art communication in the old ways. Hey! What we are? You're not there working! Who is. No sooner has the net hit the water than it's clear an essential sonar device is missing. It's designed to feed data from the net directly back to the wheelhouse. We feel the net sonar, we're blind, so you kind of see how high your net is, where it is, if it's clear, if it's wide enough, if there's fish going in. We've got to take it back and fix it. Nothing really goes to plan the first time. The longer they take to get the nets out again, the further they'll be from the shoal of fish they're targeting. The mackerel are moving at over five knots. The problem being is that... So it means you've got to try and find them again. ...continues. On the Amity, with yet another bumper haul, they're becoming victims of their own success. Really get to the oh, she's heavy. More prawns. Another seven hours work. <laughs> <laughs> this job is a bad job. Jimmy's... He knows how unpredictable prawns can be. He could lose them at any time. But the crew have had only three hours sleep in two days. We're going to stop for a... See if we can't get the, the boys to get a, a few hours sleep. Because you just kind of keep working night and day. The body will collapse, so... In the morning, they'll find out if the prawns are still there. On the Chrysandra, they've caught up with the shoal of mackerel. The sonar device has been fixed and they're ready to shoot the nets again. And this is showing us how close our net is to the bottom the shape of our net and the fish going into our net. So any minute now, as well hopefully you'll see be, fish going over be pretty oh, full. Yeah. Pretty full of fish. Well uh, we can see that it's a good shoal of fish. It's a big it's a big it's a good shoal of fish. Nothing's left to chance. When the sonar tells them the net is full, it's winched up and attached to a massive pump. Unfamiliar with the new equipment, it's overheating. Skipper Willie knows the fish will be damaged if they don't get them on board fast. You could smell Which well, once we enlightened them that, that was happening. <laughs> <laughs> Everything seemed to go a little bit, yeah. a little bit better.
teething problems. The Chrysandra's first That's a good haul. Approximately 500 ton, which is a fine size of haul for the first one. Well, it's a fine size of haul for the second one as well. Just one haul has brought them 500 tons of fish. The mackerel are loaded into tanks of chilled seawater to keep them fresh for the trip home. Homeward bound. On the Renown, after a disappointing start to his trip, James is staking everything on a haul at a place known as the Graveyard. It's a patch of shallow water where two currents meet. It can be a dangerous place for sh That's the Graveyard, the area they call the Graveyard. And there's a, there's a few vessels went down there. A lot of people lost their lives there. Over the centuries, dozens of boats have sunk in the graveyard, many of them fishing boats, caught out by its exposed position and unpredictable seas. James knows that cod and haddock like to hide among the wreckage on the seabed. Somewhere for them to hide. If I was a fish, that's where I would stay. <laughs> that's where I would be. <laughs> Catching the fish means casting his net dangerously close to the wrecks. It's very, very high risk. Everything is just at the limit for getting our own. I mean, we've lost nets here before. We've broken ropes countless times on the same place of ground. But when you do get our home, it's usually worth it. James's biggest fear is snagging the... That's the course that the boat is taking, the way you are on it. The wreck is here. A powerful winch starts to walk aboard, dragging the net along the seabed as close to the wreckage as possible. Within minutes, the winch stops. She's uh, hard fast in the bottom. It's just just about to break and strain just now. Oops. And if she breaks, she'll come forward with so big a stretch, getting her so much spring in the rope. tries to free the net, the crew stand by. The Chris Andra's on her way home to Peter Head. on board. A skipper can relax at last. My wife and daughter will be standing at the at the breakwater here waving us coming in. Ah, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Pounds. And straight into the processing factory. The Chris Andrews work is done. On the Renown, James is still trying to free his fishing nets from a sunken wreck.
them clear. Nearly. <laughs> For deckhand James Mackay, this haul has made the whole trip worthwhile. That's made the trip good. From average to really good. In the end, James's gamble at the graveyard yields over ten thousand pounds worth of cord and haddock. You sleep well tonight. <laughs> no sleep for the crew yet. They've still got fish to gut, but a hymn helps keep their spirits up. Christ in the vessel we can smile. We go sailing home. <laughs> sailing home. Sailing, sailing home. With Christ in the vessel we can smile at. They've had yet another lucrative haul of prawns. Another 24. How good is money in the bank if you can't enjoy it? Huh? Oh dear. As fatigue sets in, work on the deck becomes dangerous. It could hardly be a worse time for Jimmy to be getting visitors. A fishery protection vessel has singled him out for a random search. If his records are not complete, or he's caught more than his quota of fish, his boat can be impounded. Go get that log back up to date before he boards. And with us being so busy, I ain't time to make it up yet. <laughs> Jimmy's going to jail. <laughs> Jimmy faces the future, and Sandy Watt hands over the wheel 